what what does it take to get this stuff off this is witchcraft hello internet my name is quentin and this is blondie hacks i've decided it's time to up my metal finishing game quite a bit i've been wondering is it possible to do powder coating in a small hobby shop if you don't have the money and or space for big ovens and other exotic equipment and chemicals and so on? And the answer is yes, you can. And I'll show you right now. First, a disclaimer. I am not an expert at powder coating. I'm not even a novice at powder coating. I have literally never done this before. What I have done, however, is talk to a lot of experts, read a couple of books, synthesized a lot of information, and that's what you're gonna see here. Hopefully you can learn along with me and you'll see what it's like to do it for your first time. What I have here is the way most people probably start, which is the Eastwood powder coating kit. I paid for this with my own money, not sponsored, but it does seem like a pretty good kit and it's one of the only home powder coating kits on the market, I think. Now here's what comes in the kit. There's inline filters for the air, it's pretty nifty. There's fiberglass tape, that's a high heat tape for masking things off. There's silicone plugs for, oh, threads. Yeah, right, that's what those are for. Threads, definitely threads. And this is the Beginner's Guide to Powder Coating. That book is an add-on that I added to my order. The kit also comes with stainless steel wire for hanging your parts. Of course, it comes with some powder coat. This is their standard eight ounce jet black powder coating bottle. And it also comes with some extra bottles for mixing other colors. And then of course, this is the gun itself. It's so quite a nice kit, it's pretty reasonably priced, and Eastwood now ships to Canada, so that's a pretty awesome thing. That's one of the main barriers that I had previously to trying this at home, was getting this stuff in Canada was previously difficult, but uh, thanks Eastwood for hooking up the Canucks. In addition to the gun, you've got the power supply. This is the dual voltage model, which as far as I can tell, the higher voltage allows you to do double coating effects, so you can do blends and fades and two-tone effects, things like that. Although from everyone I talk to, everyone just says, put it on a higher voltage and leave it there. So I don't know, the lower voltage doesn't seem to matter much, but the dual voltage kit is worthwhile just to get the higher voltage. This is the entire kit then. Once again, note the powder coating beginner's guidebook is an additional 16 bucks. I added that to my order and I strongly recommend you do as well. That book is excellent. That book is a masterclass on powder coating. It teaches you everything you need to know, all the stuff you should and shouldn't do, and it's got some advanced techniques in the back like fades and two-tone effects, hot flocking, all kinds of cool stuff. So strong recommend for that book. Now, what is not in this kit, you might notice, is an oven. Eastwood used to sell a kit that included quite a nice small size powder coating oven, perfect for hobbyists. They don't include that oven anymore in this kit and they don't seem to sell that oven anymore. So you need to find some other oven-like solution. Don't use your kitchen oven for this because you, you will fill whatever oven you use with nasty chemicals and the oven has to be electric. Do not use a gas oven for this because the powder coating powder is flammable. If you have space in your shop for a secondhand kitchen oven that you can go get at Goodwill, something like that, that's a great option. I do not have that much space in my shop. However, the good news on this front is that toaster ovens nowadays actually come in quite a range of sizes. It used to be they were really small and too small for anything useful in powder coating. However, nowadays people want to cook pizzas in them so you can get these large size pizza ovens. I went to all my local thrift shops and couldn't find anything secondhand, so I had to go ahead and buy something new. So I went on Amazon and I bought the cheapest large format toaster oven. And well, this is how they shipped it. Great packing job, Amazon, no notes here. That outer box is really quite large though. Maybe I've been spending too much time around cats, but that looks just about right for a person to, yeah. Why don't we just, uh, that's, that's, yeah, look at that, it's pretty comfortable. Yeah, I gotta say though, they don't make boxes like they used to. Yeah, you heard me, the box was weak. That's right, that's why it broke, because the box was weak. How old are you? What are you even doing? I'll link to this oven and all the other stuff I bought here down below in the show notes. I will say this oven seems to be working okay for this, but I wouldn't say it was the best choice. I mean, you get what you pay for with, well, everything. And uh, this being the cheapest oven you can buy, it definitely shows. But it is big enough to do all of the parts on my model locomotive project, which is really what I bought it for. It comes with a bunch of accessories, some of which can be useful for hanging parts in here or for using to cool parts down, things like that. So keep all of the accessories. 
They can all come in handy for various powder coating jobs. This unit also features the world's most hilariously short cord. I guess they expect you to have an outlet exactly wherever you want this thing to be. I'll just slide that over a little bit, and victory. The other fun feature of this oven is that they've bucked the 50-year convention of the standard oven interface, which is that there's a light that turns on when it's heating and shuts off when it's achieved the desired temperature. This does not have that. It has a power light that just remains on, and you have no idea how hot it is. I guess that saved them 12 cents. Well, I was going to have to calibrate it anyway because toaster ovens have notoriously poor temperature regulation. So really you need to calibrate them to a clock so you know how long they take to get to the desired temperature and what the effect of opening the door is and so on. I decided to do this with my Fluke because it always makes me feel lucky. I have the temperature probe attachment for it. It's not the best way to do this. Something like an infrared thermometer would be better, but I've got one of those on order. I timed it at about 6 minutes from cold to get to 400 degrees, and it takes about 3 or 4 minutes to recover back to 400 when you open the door. So that's good information that we will need. Interestingly, this oven claims to hit 425. I was never able to get it that hot. Once again, toaster ovens notoriously lie about how hot they will get. Ideally, you'd want an oven that goes to 500, but 400 is enough for most powder coats. With the oven sorted, the next step is air. The gun needs air. The good news is it needs very, very little air. In fact, that's what pushed me over the edge into trying powder coating, is that the air requirements are very low. So my little trim compressor that I use for running model engines can more than run this gun. You only need about 10 PSI and about 10 cubic feet per minute, which is really nothing in the compressed air world. So I didn't have to go and invest in a big air compressor and figure out how to fit that into my tiny shop and so on. You will need a low pressure regulator. I have one here that I already own, again, for running model engines. You need to regulate the 120 PSI of tank pressure down to about eight PSI, which is what the gun wants. Next, you'll need an air filter and an air dryer. Those are both very important. The number one enemy of powder coating is moisture and or humidity. The air has got to be clean and dry. I got a little cleaner dryer combo unit, the thing in blue there at the hardware store. Those are easy to get. The Eastwood kit also comes with these white plastic inline filters. I don't believe these are dryers, they're just filters. So I put one of those in line as well. So in principle, I've got a dryer and two filters, which can't hurt. For the last mile of hose, I'm using plain old silicone tubing with zip ties. Again, the pressure here is so low at this end that that's more than enough. This is the same setup that I use to run my model engines up to 20 PSI, and that silicone tubing works just fine. Even the zip ties work just fine. There's no leaks from that. With air pressure this low, you don't need any kind of fancy dedicated air hose. Nothing like that is necessary. The gun is just an overgrown airbrush. That's really all it's doing. In fact, I bet you could build yourself one of these guns with an airbrush and something like a microwave transformer, but I'm not going to tell you how to do that. The one trick feature on this setup is the air pressure gauge. It's actually fairly difficult to find pressure gauges that read very, very low. And that unit there is actually a garden tractor tire pressure gauge that you can find at most auto parts stores. Those are the only air pressure gauges I've been able to find that read really low, like below 20 PSI accurately. So that gauge reads like zero to 15 PSI. Perfect for this application. Garden tractors have very low pressure tires because they want low ground pressure. So the tire pressure gauges for those tractors read very low. The main air line goes into the compressor and we're ready to go for air. Next up is the deflector. The book says this is necessary for doing large flat surfaces to get an even coating of powder. However, for small detail parts, you're supposed to remove this guy. So I'm going to do that because small and detailed describes everything that I'm going to be using this gun for. The final piece of the puzzle is some sort of booth in which to spray the powder. I'm using this guy. This is a Wagner portable spray shelter. I use this thing for spray painting indoors, but Honestly, a big cardboard box works just fine. You don't need any kind of ventilation or drafting in the paint booth. This Wagner thing, though, is really nice. It's really small, and to set it up, you basically just let go of it and stand back, an instant paint booth. It's the same sproying technology as is used in car sunshields. Then in the back, there's those elastic straps, and they hold a standard 20-inch furnace filter. You can see all the black on there because I've used it for quite a bit of spray painting. And you can see how much draft this thing really does create. There's a lot of paint in that filter. And then in the back of the booth, there's a pocket for a standard 20-inch residential box fan. 
these two units together form quite a good drafting paint booth. Now it's not a full on like chemical fume hood. You do still have to wear a respirator while painting, but this booth really does prevent all overspray from spray painting. It's really quite nice. Allows you to paint indoors and not be so subject to the weather. However, for powder coating, you do not want to use the draft fan. I've put the filter in there just to block the opening on the back of the booth, but you do not want draft when powder coating because that will interfere with the powder flocking around the part. You really don't need draft anyway. There's virtually no overspray from this process. It's shockingly tidy. The gun sprays just a little bit of powder and it all sticks right to the part. It doesn't fly all over the place like you would expect that it would. You're going to need some way to hang the parts in the oven. In my case, this oven has these little cross members here, which are actually reasonably skookum for the small parts that I'm going to be hanging. So I think I'm going to use those. These appear to actually just be guards that protect you from banging your hand into the heating elements that are behind them, which I'm sure are fairly fragile. But if I'm careful, I can use those to hang parts. If your oven is large enough, you can use the oven rack as well to hang parts from. But with this little oven, I need all the height I can get. Next, I need a way to hang the parts in my paint booth. I've decided to make a little folding A-frame from this. I have some scrap lumber. Fun fact, this lumber is from the crates that I used to move into this shop. No part of the buffalo gets wasted in the Blondie Hacks shop. It's important to have a hanging system in the booth that is the same one that's going to be used in the oven so that you can transfer the parts without touching them straight from one area to the other. Looks like I've got a little bit of taper in these parts, but I think it'll still be okay. I've made these legs such that they will fold up around a piece of stainless steel round bar that I found in the scrap bin. And the entire assembly when folded up will be the same size as that 20 inch box fan that I showed earlier. And that way I can store this with my paint booth when it's collapsed and it won't take up any additional space in my shop. So I will have a complete powder coating setup that doesn't take up any space. That's the dream. I was aiming for a light press on this round bar. It seems like I've managed that. A little tappy tap tap taps the bar into the legs and that'll stay in place just with friction, but the legs will still fold up. So I think this is just crazy enough to work. To increase stability, I'll mark and cut some bevels on the bottoms of the legs. I've got it set up on my bench with the legs at the correct distance apart. I measured front and back, and now I can mark those off such that they will be a straight cut that will have the legs sitting at the desired angle. My little bandsaw made quick work of that. I also added a little piece of string to the legs to keep them the correct distance apart. And voila, one collapsible A-frame with a stainless steel bar at the top which will conduct electricity and not be prone to collecting powder coat. All right, let's give this setup a whirl. I've got a test part here that has a convenient hole in it, and this part is intentionally brass because the real problem I'm trying to solve here is to get a good looking and reliable and durable coating for brass for all of my model making. Step one is to degrease the part thoroughly with acetone. You want to use the good stuff here, not IPA. You need a very thorough degreasing. And once degreased, you can't touch the part with your hands anymore because your fingerprints will mess up the powder coat. Next, we need to get the stainless steel wire attached to the part. And this is to hang it in the paint booth and in the oven and also forms the electrical connection, which is very important. This is the ground connection and this has to be a good electrical connection. Better than what I have here. More on that in a second. Now I can get my A-frame in the booth and get ready to hang the part in here. Once again, the most important part, according to all of the experts, is the ground connection. Everyone agrees 99.9% .9 of all powder coating problems are caused by an insufficient ground. I've got the ground clip on my stainless steel bar for more complex or intricate parts. The experts also all agree that it's worth running a dedicated ground wire from the part to something like a wall box or a ground post in the dirt or a water pipe, something like that. A dedicated, really, really solid ground makes sure that this process works well. It's also well worth doing a couple of practice runs of moving the part from the paint booth into the oven. You have to be able to do this without that part touching anything. When the powder is sitting on it, it's very delicate. 
And if anything touches that surface, it's ruined. You have to blow the powder off with an air gun and start over. If your hook is the wrong shape or too long or whatever, that it won't fit in the oven, now is the time to find out. The gun has this little button, which is the voltage, and the trigger on the gun is the air. So you hold down the button, pull the trigger, and away you go. You can see how little powder comes out of that gun. It really does not take much, and there's virtually no overspray because all of the powder is drawn right back onto the part. Now, you do want to spin the part around while you do this. The book claims that the powder will magically bend around the back and stick to the back of the part. It does to some degree, but you can't count on that. You really need to spin the part around and get it from all sides. Among the many great tips in the Eastwood book is that you should shine a bright light on the part while it's still in the booth and that will reveal any thin spots that you have in the powder. You can see the base metal through under a bright light if the powder is too thin, and I do have a spot like that, so I'll go ahead and hit that spot a little bit more. And again, if you're continuously getting thin spots and the thin spots are still there after baking, then it's always gonna be a ground problem. On the part you see here, my ground really isn't good enough. I've got a very loose hook on the part and on the bar at the top, and really you wanna do better than that. A threaded fastener is ideal, but at the very least a couple of wraps of wire is necessary to get a good connection. I got away with this mostly as you'll see, but do better. Now the tricky part, the carefully rehearsed move into the oven. It's been preheated to 400 degrees at this point. I'm gonna hang it on there, doing my very best not to touch it. I'm still using the Fluke temperature probe as you see there. I've got an infrared thermometer on order, but this is working for now. Now you gotta let that oven come back up to 400 after opening the door. And once it does, then you can start the timer. I go ahead and set my timer for 30 minutes now because I know it takes at most 10 minutes to get back to 400 and 20 minutes is what the part requires to cure. You can watch the part and you'll see kind of a shiny liquidy surface form on it and that's the powder starting to flow. Once you see that, then you can start the 20 minute timer from there. And all these variables are very forgiving. If the temperature is a little too low or a little too high, it doesn't matter. You can go all the way up to 500 or all the way down to 350 with most powders. You can leave it in there for an hour or two hours. doesn't matter. You won't hurt it. It'll still work. That's really the strength of this process is how forgiving it all is. While that's baking, let's take a look at a part I did previously. This was my very first test part. The finish on it is just outstanding. It looks beautiful, feels great, and the durability of it is really quite impressive. I mean, I'm really gouging at it with that razor blade and I'm scratching it, but not much more than that. Let's take a look at the competition for comparison. This is a piece that I painted, and lest you think I skimped on this, that part was mechanically keyed. It has three coats of acid etch primer and three coats of a top quality high strength enamel that was also left to cure for a full week. So that is about as good as you can do painting brass with traditional paint. And you can see the difference is night and day. The painted part is basically garbage compared to the powder coat. After 20 minutes, I can pull this other part out of the oven, let it cool off, which doesn't take long because it's so small. And you can see, once again, that part is really fantastic. Even with the not very good ground, the finish is still excellent. You can see on the back, though, that it is thin. And that's because, again, my ground wasn't good enough. So that thinness that you see where the metal's showing through, that's what a bad ground looks like. This isn't the end of the world. With the high voltage power supply in this kit, you can actually just coat that area again, and it'll work just fine but you can see how the durability is not affected by that bad ground. The areas that did get good coverage are just as good as the first piece that had better ground. It's really, really an amazing process. I'm sorry if this sounds like a sales pitch, because honestly, I feel like a salesperson for this. I'm a powder coating converted zealot now. This process is honestly easier than painting, and the results are just night and day better. The next question I had was, how thick is this coating? One of my concerns was that powder coating was going to be too thick for really practical use on small models because a lot of the pieces need close tolerance fits. So I decided to clean off an area to try and measure the thickness of it and, well, that was kind of difficult. I went through a lot of different methods trying to find something that would remove this stuff. This stuff is really hard to remove. It's very impressively adhered to that, which for bare brass is really amazing. If you've never painted brass, then you don't understand how difficult it is. Nothing sticks to brass. A file is finally what I had to resort to to remove that stuff. Now I've got a clean area on both sides that I can measure the thickness of. Unsurprisingly, that's exactly 62 and a half thou. This is 1 16th brass, so that's not at all surprising. And I've got an area down here that's unmolested on both sides with full powder coat thickness. And here we have exactly 63 and a half thou. 
That's pretty interesting. The part is exactly one thou thicker, which means that coating is half a thou thick on each side. That's quite a bit thinner than I expected, actually. That's probably thinner than that paint. And there's six layers of paint on that other part. And I know from having fit those parts together on my tender trucks that there was quite a bit of thickness there. Now I'm applying all of the lessons that I learned on those test parts to an actual piece of the model locomotive that I hope to powder coat. It's all brass, and as I said before, brass is very, very difficult to paint, so powder coating hopefully will be the answer. This time, as you can see, I've got a dedicated ground wire. I've bolted a plate through one of the bolt holes in such a way that the area covered won't be visible when the part is mounted. I did definitely notice the improvement in powder adhesion from having a dedicated ground. I do think that's a really good idea. It's also nice to have the ground be different than the mechanical hook. That makes it easier to move it into the oven. I'm super pleased with the final result. Other than a small area that was shadowed by the plate, the powder coat finish on this is pretty much flawless. Now powder coating does not hide sins. You can see little roughness and high spots and low spots here. Those are all in the material. That's all my craftsmanship or lack thereof that you're seeing. And the powder coat does not hide any of it. But I'm really, really pleased with this process. Honestly, it's so easy and tidy and the results are so excellent. I may never paint anything again. That's my little spiel on powder coating. I'm really excited about this. Honestly, I find it easier than painting. It's pretty fussy to acquire all the equipment and get it all set up, but once you're set up, it's really a remarkable, easy and effective process. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of it. I kinda of wanna powder coat everything. I might not ever paint anything ever again. So watch for it in future videos. Thank you so much for watching and thanks to my patrons for making all of this content possible and I'll see you next time.